Okay. Uh, this is How Neurons Make Its Jump, the Neural Control of Stretch Shortening Cycle Movements by Wolfgang Taub uh, and uh, his crew. Uh, this is the second study that we had uh, talked about from, from Wolfgang, and uh, it's another fantastic one. It's got a lot of uh, positives to this study that I haven't seen other places. So let's get to it. Uh, let's talk about the presetting and shifts in the EMG force and kinematic. So in this next figure, you're going to see the, uh, we're only looking at the soleus right now. And uh, you, are there other EMGs and muscles that are active? Absolutely. But I think that this is just uh, something that's, that's really, really interesting. Uh, we're going to look at the anticipatory firing of the soleus prior to ground contact uh, under an up platform, level platform, down platform, respectively. So uh, they, what do I mean by this? Well, they had this uh, movable jump platform. So that sounds pretty cool. I don't know how long it, it took to, to move, but they would have it shift up or shift down. Uh, so that they could look and see how do you land with uh, changes in anticipation. So here's what we see, that in the up, so whenever the drop was lower, uh, the we can see that they had a uh, their anticipatory firing, right? Here's where it is, uh, here's where it, the blue is leveled and the red uh, dashed is, is down. So we can see that, hey, we've got anticipatory firing and this is what we're dealing with. Uh, whenever we step down before we make contact with the ground, as we can see from the red line, that, hey, this increase in firing is happening just before we make ground contact. So you're, you have this anticipation that is, is setting the muscle and that's allowing for the appropriate amount of stretch. Now, the greater the drop, the greater the total EMG signal, uh, and the greater that we are, uh, and why is that going to be? Well, because you're going to be setting with a greater amount of force depending on the jump height. Uh, so that's just something that's pretty cool that, hey, your body knows by you looking down. And if you think back about that predict, uh, well, maybe that's in this study, with the predicted uh, consequences and the actual consequences and you're getting that feedback, well, that tells you how much you need to set your pretension. Now, why is that important? Well, if you don't have your pretension set, then there's not going to be a force decentric. Okay, and if there's no force decentric, there's no stretch shortening cycle. So really, pretension has got to be there, uh, excluding for the little bit that the muscle spindle is going to do, which you saw in the short latency response versus the long latency response uh, before. So that long latency response, that's really uh, where we're getting that stored elastic energy. You know, we're getting that, that kind of force from. Now, here we look at from different heights, and what we need to notice is the shift in the EMG further and further behind the ground reaction forces. So whenever we're hopping, we have so much tension set that we actually have our peak EMG before we actually uh, make contact with the ground. I mean, we're, if we look, look how much. They don't preset too terribly much, but then they have the spike right there at the contact, and then they jump. Well, if we look at the greater and greater heights, well, that peak EMG is falling further and further behind the peak ground reaction forces. And the peak ground reaction force, what's that going to occur basically whenever the heel hits? Now, we see at 80 centimeters that the peaks are so far to the right. And shoot, within this uh, uh, dark zone, we see that at 80 centimeters, it's not hitting peak until far after that, far after that ground contact. Now, why is that? It's because there's so much force that's being involved with this. We see if this is 2,500 Newtons, we're seeing like 5,000, 7,500, somewhere around in there, Newtons here versus the 2,500 that, we, that it took here. Now, why is that so important? Because the increase in force, this is where that 80 centimeters turns into that yielding regime or that pleometrics or shock method training, as Yuri Voroshansky would call it. Uh, so we see that, hey, our muscle action, uh, you know, it, it's, and look at the ground reaction forces and how far out they go for how much time they have to uh, overcome the force. So I think that that was a pretty cool illustration here. And this has to go back with, as I mentioned here, with the initial motor command, we have our predict, uh, predicted consequences and our actual consequences coming back from the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. <laughs> the cerebellum is telling us what the actual consequences are uh, in making adjustments 
uh, to give us feedback where the basal ganglia is saying, hey, this is what should be happening. So the portion of the movement planned without the peripheral feedback for the drop jump, the instant of ground contact, floor surface, and, and movement goal, rebound as fast uh, versus as high as possible. So that's the signal that you're giving him. Am I trying to rebound or am I trying to jump as high as possible? And the rebound would be the drop jump. The highest possible is the depth jump. So we see that there's actually two different uh, goals. And we remember that from training, we've got to keep the goal the goal. The goal is always to keep the goal the goal. And while that sounds stupid and silly and sing-songy, uh, it's extremely important for training because, you know, we, you think, oh, that looks cool. Oh, that looks cool. Oh, that looks cool. But if you don't remember what the goal of training is and have all of the exercises, sets, reps, intensities uh, to meet that goal, you're not going to get as good a result. So then what's going to happen? Okay, after we hit the ground, we have this feed forward. Uh, prediction of the time of ground contact, pre innervation so that's the pre-tension resetting. The 1A afferent gating, so we're getting that ready to go, right? It's opening up. Uh, the muscle spinsel sensitivity, okay, well, that's depending on the floor height, uh, the movement instruction, the setting, you know, what kind of surface there is, etc. Uh, maybe you are thinking you're going to be hitting a super stiff ground and you hit a real spongy ground, so then, you know, that would change things. Now a touchdown, the feedback circuits are engaged. So then that's shifting it back up and telling us, hey, what, what happened here? What were our joint angles and moments? You know, was that what we thought it was going to be? What was my muscle stretch? Did I have enough tension to be able to prevent excessive downward movement? Uh, the excitation of the afferents, those 1A and the 1B, you know, uh, what's going to be engaged? Are we looking at the muscle spindle? Is it too much tension? What are we looking at here? Uh, and then the, depending on the environment, the body kinematics, what happened? Did the knees shift in? Did they shift out? Did they go too far forward? Did our heels hit? You know, what happened? So then we are going to enhance that feed forward for the next one, uh, for the next. So whenever we're doing multiple repetitions, we see that we're going to have that update of the model, which is going to change the initial motor command. And this goes hand in hand with uh, if there's any time that you have oh gosh, you know, you've done an exercise, uh, done a jump, right? Uh, you know, my, my five-year-old has got this game that she loves playing where, you know, we, we live by a local high school where she comes over and then she jumps off of a, a ledge. It's about three feet high, hits the ground. And uh, if she did a good jump, she gets to go pet the dog. And if she didn't, she just goes back and tries again. What's a good jump? Yeah, I still haven't figured that out for her. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I, I think that she just makes it up as she goes along. Uh, but long story short, you know, this is what we're dealing with, with the feed forward, feedback, update the internal uh, model. It's like, okay, that wasn't good. What do I need to do for this next one? Uh, so that I can make it happen like I want to. You know, we've all had that where we thought that the box was a little bit higher, a little bit lower than we thought. First repetition is horrible. Second, third, fourth, and, you know, by that fourth or fifth repetition, everything's money, and we're able to do it every time. You know, we've, we've all had those experiences with training. So this is no different. Now, one of the really super cool things about this study is we talked about how they had that level up, level down uh, platform. Well, they were doing a drop jump, and they were told, is this no switch, or is there a potential switch? So nothing actually changed, but there was a possibility of it being changed. Now, we see this is the EMG, and these are the ground reaction forces. The dark black line is the no jump, I'm sorry, the no switch condition. So you hit the ground, you jump up, you know exactly what's going to be happening. We see that we've got this pretty sharp, fairly smooth spike and it drops back off after we complete the jump. We look at the ground reaction forces. It's this nice sharp spike drops back off. Now they were told on some of the repetitions, oops, that we were going that there was the possibility of the drop height changing mid jump. So what does the person do? Well, they anticipate. And by anticipating, because they don't know what's going to happen, they anticipate this change. So this takes longer for the EMG to come on. 
uh, we, it doesn't spike up as high, so they don't give as many millivolts. They don't have as strong of the possible contraction. And then the ground reaction forces are not as high, but they're far prolonged because they aren't as able whenever we're looking at the time. That's how we knew it was for much longer. Uh, they aren't able to turn on this sharp force because they don't know what's happening. They're being you know, timid, essentially. And why are they being timid? Because they don't know what's going to happen. So we see that there's a clear difference between whenever somebody knows what's happening and when somebody doesn't. Okay. Now, is there more information in this study? Absolutely. And I highly recommend that you read it if you are uh, interested in this sort of thing. These are just basically the highlights uh, in, for uh, going over this for one of my uh, classes at the University of Miami. If this is the sort of information that you love, you, you get excited about this stuff and with training, uh, come join us at the U. Uh, if you're wanting to be a strength and conditioning coach, physical therapist, something along those lines, uh, you're looking to go back to school or undergraduate in uh, in the kinesiology and sports sciences department is is next to none. Uh, we got tremendous faculty here. Uh, if you're interested in strength and conditioning uh, and you've already got completed a bachelor's degree, you know that this is what you want to do. You have no interest in going back and getting a second bachelor's. Cool, I got you. We've got a master's in applied physiology here that has strength and conditioning as a focus where you'll have uh, professors like myself, Brian Biagioli, uh, Wes Smith, Kevin Jacobs, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on and on, uh, to be able to get you prepared for either a one-year or two-year track. We've got an accelerated track and the, the normal. You're already a coach. You don't need a master's degree. Okay. Uh, but maybe you don't have a tremendous amount of education in this. Well, I've got you there too. We've got some coaches education courses. Uh, I've got a eight week that should be coming out at the beginning of February. Uh, we'll start, I'll post it whenever the, uh, the uh, enrollment becomes live. An eight week general strength and conditioning introduction where you're going to learn things like oh let's look at programming let's look at auto regulation of training let's look at how not to burn yourself out okay and then uh, upcoming in 2021 we're also going to have a essentially choose your own adventure courses where if you there are specific topics that you want to take pick three of these topics you're good to go right uh, and all of them are going to be for ceus through the nsca uh, and those uh, details are getting uh, ironed out right now. So if you like this, please come join us at the U. We'd love to have you.